when you look at me, you might first instantly stereotype my glasses, my skin color, my gait. You might assume that I am bookish. You would be right. You might think that I'm not athletically very fast. You would be absolutely right. You might assume my ethnicity. You may or may not be right. Well, there are a lot of things that you could guess about me. And there's a high chance that you would be right about many of them. But what about those things that you cannot guess, that you do not see about me? I bet you wouldn't know that the fetal position is my favorite to sleep in, that I art and believe in world peace, that I write and breathe poetry, that I love the smell of petrichor, and I love the conglomeration of images, sounds, colors, smells, and touch, that I do not believe in blind faith, and I question everything, that once in sixth grade, I actually ran six miles, but ended up last. That I have a mild obsession with stories and metaphors, and a greater obsession with the languages they are told in. The point is this, that you can guess a lot of things about me, but there are also many things that you don't see about me, about anyone and that I am just as guilty of judging and stereotyping as anyone else. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody else over here. I am Jerin Jacob, the Chief Operating Officer of One Future Collective, a not-for-profit organization that works at developing compassionate youth social leadership by focusing on areas of mental health, legal reform, gender justice, and development policy. I am also a doctoral researcher at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, and as rightly said before this, I am researching on local and feminist retellings of biblical narratives. Today, I am going to be talking to you about revamping stereotypes through empathy. A few days back, a friend called me. She was in a hurry, she was disturbed, and she told me that her little child of three years was refusing to write. Not in school, not at home, not during play hours, not otherwise, not at all. The child just refused to pick up the pencil and write. Without a second thought, I started sharing, suggesting alternative options, experiments, games, activities that usually encourage preschoolers to write. When suddenly, I was hit by a thought. Hey, are you sure that your child is not left-handed? Oh, he plays the bat using his right hand, but I'm not very sure, you know, now that you've asked. Okay, were you or your husband left-handed as children? Oh, my husband, yes, he was left-handed until he was forced to switch and be right-handed. Oh, okay, fair enough. Uh, would you have a problem if your child ended up left-handed? Absolutely not. We have spoken this through and we are completely fine and we will encourage him even if he is left-handed. Wonderful, said I. The whole idea of a stereotype is to simplify. Instead of taking into account this great diversity around us, this immense sea of possibilities, we all reduce it down to one large statement. This is right, and this is only right. I have had to face my own set of challenges to overcome stereotypes throughout my life. Switching from science to arts, irrespective of being the top scorer all along. People asked me, did you not clear the entrance exam? Moving to Delhi to pursue my master's in English literature, people told me, how irresponsible of your parents to be sending you to Delhi, which is such an unsafe city. Cropping my hair short, people asked, not me, but my parents, don't mind our concern, but is she sick? 
being verbose, headstrong, and always having an opinion about everything. People murmured and gossiped. She's too unladylike. She's too talkative. She's too bossy. Pursuing higher research in the social sciences, people commented, do these guys even do anything? My list can go on. And I'm sure that all of you over here will have your own list to share. The problem with stereotypes is not that it is untrue, but that it is incomplete. More often than not, a stereotype makes one story the only story. And that is where the problem comes in. More often than not, today around us, we take up opportunities that are conventionally and conveniently available to us. The drive to seek more, to yearn for more, to look for more, to dive in deeper, to explore and find out options that work the better or the best for you, is scant. What does this lead to? I am often asked by friends, by acquaintances, and sometimes by even people who I have met just then, please let me know if there's any way in which I can help you with your work in the social sector. Even if it is as simple as volunteering for you, volunteering with you for a project, or helping you organize a fundraising event, anything of that sort, just let us know. As I get talking to them, as I continue to engage with them further, I get to know of the sense of ennui, more often than not, the sense of dissatisfaction that creeps in from doing something that does not rage your spirits, from doing something that you are not passionate about. What happens is, when you are positioned within a mechanical rut, this circular Sisyphean cycle of unemotional, habitual engagement, you end up dissatisfied more often than not. To all my friends who conveniently and always ask me, I tell them, you do not need to necessarily be in the social sector to be actually creating impact or making change. Wherever you are, whatever you do, tweak it in such a way that you actually impact lives and create change. The Greek word empathia means en pathos or in feeling. This is where the word empathy stems from. Empathy is defined as the capacity to be affected by or share in the emotional state of another person. It includes characteristics of me or either one of us sitting over here, feeling what the other person feels, identifying with them, looking for reasons as to why the other person is feeling this way, and then to adopt his or her perspective. The development of empathy in a person can be compared to the Russian dolls or nesting dolls called the Matryoshka or Babushka dolls. The photograph that you see in front of you will have the dolls placed separately from each other in a row. But actually, these nesting dolls are built one over the other in such a way that they all get inserted inside each other to form one comprehensive set. The fascinating part about this set of dolls is that they are built from the inside. The innermost, the smallest doll is built first, and then the other, other dolls keep getting built over them. When you look at empathy from this perspective, the core of empathy is emotional connection or emotional contagion. This is then supported or overcoated by concern, sympathetic concern for the other person, other people, other community, so on and so forth. Sympathetic concern involves us feeling concerned for another person's state of being, yes, but then also taking appropriate steps or measures or attempting to find the reasons behind the person's state of being and taking efforts to ameliorate the state. And finally, the topmost cover or the final stage of developing empathy in a person is adopting the perspective of another person while also understanding and keeping in mind that this is not your own. In very simple terms, empathy is stepping into another person's shoes and looking at the world from their, look after, from their perspective 
and trying to understand what they are going through at that point in time. I would like to share three stories with you about how empathy developed, so to say, in my life. But before that, let me also tell you this. You might be a banker, an investor, an educator, an entrepreneur, a youth, a student, a parent. You might do whatever you are set to do, but you can do it well and do good through it well. With the current social and political climate around us today being the way it is, in India, across the world, it is more than necessary that we recraft or rewrite our career stories in such a way that they become inclusive of characters of those around us, people around us whom we will be impacting or affecting by the work we do. The first story I would like to share goes like this. Once upon a time, a farmer wanted to take his bullock cart from his village to the city. He looked out into the skies and they were sunny and bright. He decided, chalo chalte hain. He took out his bullock cart and went on his way. After some time, the skies became grey and dark and soon enough it began to rain a lot. What happened soon after is that the wheels of the bullock cart got stuck in the wet mud and muck which was caused by the rain. The farmer tried and tried to pull the wheels of the bullock cart out of the muck, but to no avail. He desperately tried looking for help around him, but it was a desolate spot, so he did not get help. After hours and hours of waiting, a stranger came by, helped the farmer, and then quietly walked away. I told this story to my little brother when he was three years old, who then had a lot of questions to ask me. But later, during one of our family get-togethers, when a relative asked him, what do you want to be when you grow up? Without a second thought, my brother answered, I want to be a stranger when I grow up. It struck me later but it struck me hard. How often do we ask our children, or how often do we ask each other, what do you want to be when you grow up? Empathetically speaking, shouldn't our perspective change the question being asked, to what problem do you want to solve when you grow up? The child in this story stood in the shoes of the farmer and realized that there are people around him who might need help at some point or the other. He then stood in the shoes of the stranger and realized that like the stranger, he could be of help to so many people around him. This is how empathy works. Until a few months back, I was teaching at a school. I was teaching literature and language at a school. And this is an incident that took place during one of my initial classes, and mind you, this was uh, with the students of grade 7. The bell had just rung, and I was not able to finish my portion allocated for that day. So I look at my class, I address my students, and I tell them, Children, is it okay if I give you both these essays to complete on your home, for homework today? It's completely fine if you tell me no, because I understand, you know, that you have classes and tuitions and extracurricular activities. Just think about it and tell me if you'll be able to do this by yourself tonight. The students stared at me, looked at each other, supremely confused, and when I wasn't receiving any response, I repeated my question. One of my students, this boy, stood up. He placed his hands on his hips, looks into my eyes and tells me, Ma'am, you are the teacher. You are not supposed to be asking us whether this is okay or this is not. You will tell us what to do and we will do what you tell us to. You need to be strict with us and not kind. I took some time to understand where this was coming from and it broke my heart a little. Throughout my time with these students there on, I tried to encourage the practice and the culture of calling my students in 
instead of calling them out whenever there was a misunderstanding in the classroom, whenever there was tensions between children and me, whenever they made problematic statements which to me as an adult needed correction, so on and so forth. I tried to make them understand that receiving kindness and empathy is not a matter of privilege, but a living concern, a living virtue. It doesn't matter whether you are looking towards the blackboard or away from the blackboard in a classroom. Every single person in the classroom deserves empathy, a lot of it. If there has been one thing, this is the next story. If there has been one thing that has fascinated me right since my childhood, it has been stories in different forms, different languages, Stories designed my life right from the very beginning, thanks to my parents. Right from hearing stories, to reading them, to drawing and sketching through them, to telling stories, to retelling them, to today using storytelling for social justice and transformation. My journey with this form has been one of a kind. I would usually spend a lot of time reading mythological stories across cultures, across languages. But what particularly fascinated me was biblical stories. I had this one Bible, which was a collection of children's stories, biblical stories for the children. And I would thrive on it. Those were stories I would read day in and day out, and those characters would literally play out in my mind. Slowly, slowly, growing up, questioning, understanding more, knowing more, I started feeling more and more dissatisfied with the structure of the stories per se in the original text. The structure, the form, the dialogues, the agency, the perspectives, the language. I felt that there could have been more done here, especially with relation to the representation of female characters in the Bible. While I sat down to contemplate as to what my topic for research will be, I wanted it to be something that stemmed from my experience, something that I could call my own and something that defined who I am even today, and bam, this was it. I decided that there needed to be retellings of biblical narratives in the Indian context as well, but what fascinated me more was that I realized there were actually retellings happening in local capacities, individual capacities, through art, through storytelling, through various narrative, uh, narratorial forms. They only waited to be identified, documented, analyzed, and disseminated. Now that I look back at it, I realized that the reason why I even thought of these characters from this approach was because I was empathetic to them. These characters were playing around in my mind and I felt that their stories were incomplete. I, to I felt that their stories were not told enough. And that is when I realized that I think I need to do something for them. This is what brings me here to all of you today. And I hope, wish that all of you and the choices that you make are yours to make, yours to keep, but for the world to gain. To leave you with this, if you want to transform experience, you need to challenge, to question, to conceive of alternatives, sometimes to the very life that you're living at the moment. The call of the day is to revamp, to reconstruct stereotypes, to step out of boxes of convenience, comfort, and privilege, to look out for more, reach out for more, to do what you want to do, the way you want to do, but at the same time, doing it all with empathy. Thank you.